We are in a series right now called Jesus Culture. We're working through the Sermon on the Mount. And we've said sort of the heart behind this series, the the vision of this series, is we just want to be a church that smells more and more like Jesus. (laughs) We want to have, be that fragrant aroma of Christ to each other but also to our community and, and the world uh, around us. And so um, that's kind of the, the heartbeat, and that's what the Sermon on the Mount really is, is there for. It's to teach us how do we have the heart of God in us, the heart of Christ? How do we be his people? How can we here at Edinburgh Church be that Jesus culture? And uh, I want to start this morning by just asking us a question. What kind of changes have you seen in your lifetime, culturally speaking? What have you seen change in the world around you? I was thinking about that this this past week, and if you're a young adult or a a teenager, some of this might be a little eye-opening for you uh, when you you, uh, hear maybe what it was like when when I was growing up. I'm kind of an 80s kid. I I grew up in the 80s and and 90s. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, the TV we had in our house didn't even have a remote control. Okay. You, you, you actually had to get up. It, it, it was this giant box. Some of you remember. The screen was about this big, okay, but the box weighed like a thousand pounds, and that was so you could put your knickknacks on top, right? Who remembers this? And I guess technically there was a remote control. It was called me, okay? And uh, my parents would send me to, the, you know, and you had to adjust right, these knobs, and there were about five channels. Who remembers this, right? There were like five channels to choose from. And that was what it was like uh, when I was growing up. And then we did have something called a VCR. Who remembers the VCR? Some of you may <laughs> still have some VH dat tapes. You guys remember, you know about the VCR. And I remember the big deal was you would go to this place called the Blockbuster. <laughs> on a Friday night, you would go to a place called Blockbuster. And if you don't know what that is, think if Netflix was a building. And you'd go into this place and you would see the, 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 the picture on the front with a brief summary on the back with maybe a few more pictures. And you better choose wisely because that was going to be the movie for the week. There was none of this streaming, right? That's how it was. We've seen a lot of change. Uh, video games, man. We did have video games. We had like the Nintendo and stuff, and I don't know what it was, but it never worked on the first try. Who remembers this? You'd put it in, be like all lines on the screen, and you'd have to take it out, and you'd have to do this. Anyway. <laughs> Who remembers that? <laughs> For some reason, that fixed it. You'd pop it back in. And honestly, when I was growing up, we, we didn't even, I mean, some of you can't even fathom, we didn't even have internet. I remember when internet came around. And there was something called like AOL. You guys remember that? AOL, and you put it in. It would take like 10 minutes. It'd make all these weird noises. What was up with those noises? <laughs> you know, the beepings and popping. It just, it'd make these weird noises. And then it would take, take about 10 minutes to download the article you needed. You know, but that was so much better than having to... Go to an encyclopedia, physical book, right, and look it up. That's how much change, I mean, we've just seen in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. It's been amazing. Uh, Just this past week, Danielle and I were having a conversation, and our daughter, Callie, um, she needed something, and so she came up to us, and we were like, Callie, just give us five minutes, just five minutes. And Callie goes, Alexa, set timer for five minutes. (laughs) Wow. Wow. It's like things have changed. It's like, what, what's next? Kelly, get, you, you have 10 seconds to get over here. Alexa, set timer for 10 seconds. I was like, just in the last 30, 40 years, just incredible the amount of changes that we've seen. Well, I bring this up because this morning, we're going to start seeing some, some changes Jesus is going to make to the way the people of his day understood the Old Testament. In fact, over the next six weeks, Jesus is going to get into these specific topics where he he, he sort of reinterprets the Old Testament for us. He's going to give us a new way to think about these commands or expectations in, in the Old Testament that really get to what God's heart was all along. And so he's going to use this sort of formula where he says, you have heard it said... And then he's going to fill in the blank with some Old Testament command or expectation. 
But then he's going to say, but I tell you. And he's going to give us this new way to think about it. And so this morning, he's going to start this off, this section of the Sermon on the Mount where he does this, with the topic of anger. In Matthew 5, um, starting in verse 21, Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. So we get that. Okay. But I tell you, That anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So here's our first one, okay? Jesus is going to kind of give us a new spin. Yes, we've kind of always known that murder was wrong. Uh, And we've kind of had this way of thinking that if you're a murderer, you're kind of in this boat. What Jesus is actually going to say, even if you get angry, With someone, it can potentially put you in the same boat as that person who committed murder. And this is pretty shocking, uh, and it would have been shocking for his listeners um, to hear what Jesus is saying on this issue. Because I mean, let's be honest, and I don't think anything's changed. Anger is a big deal. I mean, it's 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 a it's very common in our culture. It's very common in the world. People are just they're. They're angry. I was trying to meet somebody at a coffee shop this past week and just waiting to get into a parking spot. I was waiting for this person to back up, and I'm just sitting there trying to wait to get in. But a guy was behind me. He didn't like that I was waiting to get into this spot. And so he zips around me and gives me a certain finger. Was it not a thumbs up? Okay. (laughs) Gives me a certain finger as he flies by in, in anger. And normally that would have just set me off. I'm going to tell you in the past that would have set me off. But now I've just gotten to a point where I just pray for their lost dark souls when they, you know, do that kind of thing. It's what I do. I just pray for them. But people are angry. Now Jesus, of course, here is he's talking more about our personal relationships with each other. Um, this can be family members. This could be a spouse. It could be a, 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 literally a brother or sister. It could be parents. Uh, It it can be extended family. This can be neighbors. This can be people in our community. It could be people right here in in our church. But he's talking about like more people we rub shoulders with and and people we know. And he's saying we need to be careful uh, on this topic uh, when it comes to to anger and harboring anger in our hearts. Does that mean all anger is wrong? No, I don't think so. Um, Anger is a human emotion and it's something we're going to feel from time to time. Uh, There is such a thing as righteous anger, okay? Um, When we see injustice in the world and we see uh, especially attack on innocence and on children and things like that, it's good to to be somewhat angry, all right? Jesus himself did get angry at times. Uh, In fact, there's a a time where Jesus goes to the temple and... uh, out in the sort of the outer courts there, there would be some religious leaders and some people called the money changers. And, and people would bring their sacrifice, a, a lamb, to be sacrificed in the temple for themselves and for their family. It was, the, again, an Old Testament way of having God overlook your sin and cover over your sin for you and your family. And so they were supposed to bring this sacrificial lamb once a year. Uh, but there would be these religious people there. And, 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 and uh, I was talking one time with a, a Jewish scholar and someone who's familiar with the background of that day. And he said what was going on here is these people would bring their best lamb. But that person that meet them there would say, your lamb's not good enough. So give us your lamb and we will give you a new lamb and you pay us the difference for the better lamb. So this person would be like, okay, this is what the religious leader is telling me to do. I need to give over my lamb. They receive the apparently better lamb and then pay the difference. So we give them money for that. Well, then the next person comes along. And they say, sorry, your lamb isn't good enough. Give us your lamb And we'll give you a better lamb, and you pay us the difference. So that person would give them their lamb. And now that lamb they would give that person, the better lamb was the lamb they had taken from the last person. 
So you're, you're understanding this was fraud, right? This was, I mean, they were taking advantage of people. And this caused Jesus to get very angry. And he saw this kind of going away. It was more about profits and making money than it was helping to build God's kingdom here on earth. Uh, Jesus ends up making a whip, <laughs> and, right? Turns over tables and, 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 and drives out the animals and the money changers out of that place. So we do see examples of the Bible of, of, of anger, of righteous anger. But I think what we need to be careful of is not harboring anger, letting anger control us, stewing in our anger. Uh, Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4. He says, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, I think some people do take this literally and they think that means you, you need to let go of any anger. You know, um, come evening time. Uh, I don't. I think this is being a little more uh, metaphorical and just talking about don't, don't hold on to, to your anger for a long period of time. I think sometimes for married couples or dealing with kids, I think sometimes the best, wisest thing you can do is g get a good night's sleep before you have the tough conversation so that you're emotionally and mentally healthy and able uh, to have that conversation. But the point here is don't stew in your anger for too long. Yeah, sometimes we are going to feel angry, and, and we're going to get angry at things we see uh, happening in the world around us, but don't, you don't want to live there. And you certainly don't want to let it um, control you, uh, because when we, when we let it control us, here's what eventually happens. Anger has a way of starting to come out sideways. It starts coming out in ways we don't even intend in towards others. And Jesus is going to give us next a specific example of, of what that looks like. In verse 22, he says, Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, now this is, a, 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 this is an insult. It's like calling someone stupid. Saying you're stupid. He says, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Okay, and by the way, this being answerable to the court, uh, Craig Keener, who's a New Testament scholar, background uh, custom scholar, uh, he says God, Jesus here has a heavenly court in mind. It, it could involve an earthly court, but he has probably more likely, he's talking about the heavenly court. So it's both the same, like calling someone stupid, saying, so calling someone a fool, this is what he's saying. He's saying it can bring God's judgment, guys, on our, on our life. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. In fact, someone uh, <laughs> has said uh, this is why anger, right, uh, is one letter short of the word danger, okay? Um, it's dangerous. It brings God's judgment on our life when we when we insult and when we call people, call people names. Some of you know uh, who Stephen Smith is. He's a sports personality journalist. Uh, Stephen Smith, if you don't know, he, he, this is, uh, he's, he, he's just pretty blunt. He's a guy who speaks his mind. Uh, he's just kind of known in the sports world for that. He just wrote a book called Straight Shooter because that's what he is. He just calls it like he sees it. And he, he pretty much offends everybody around him all the time. It's just kind of his personality. And he'll argue with people. And if he sees a problem in someone's argument, he's going to call it out. If he sees a problem with someone's behavior, he's going to call it out. He was uh, recently being interviewed for his book, Straight Shooter, and the person interviewing him asked him this question because his book is selling. And so this person said, why does anyone like you? <laughs> How would you like to be asked that question? But I loved his answer. He said, you know, I will call out people's arguments. If I see a problem with their logic, I'll tell them why they're wrong and I'll give them the reasons why. And I don't hold back. If I see a problem with someone's behavior, I will call that behavior out and tell them why it's wrong. But he said, I never attack someone's character. He said, I never attack someone's identity. 
He said, in fact, I'm the person that oftentimes when these people that I'm constantly arguing with or have differences of opinions with or calling out, when they go through a crisis, I am often one of the first people they call because they know I care about them. And guys, that's it. That, that, that's it. it. It doesn't mean, as Christians, we can't call out people's arguments and say, this is why this is wrong. It doesn't mean we can't call out behavior and say, this behavior is wrong. But what we can't do is attack people's character and use you are statements. You are fill in the blank with some negative that attacks their character or their identity. This is something God treats very, very seriously because we can really hurt people when we start calling people names and saying, this is who you are. And I know what that feels like. How many of us know what that feels like? I remember a, a friend of mine when I was younger, a supposed friend, got into this habit of calling me names, kind of developed a, a nickname for me, and I would call him out on it, and, 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 and he would just say, I'm joking. But we all know when people say they're joking, usually there's a little bit of truth to it, or at least they take a little pleasure in it, don't they? And I got to be honest with you, it, it hurt. It hurt, and, and it went on for so long, it really started to affect me. It started to affect the way I saw myself. It started to affect the way um, I saw my identity. And when I became a Christian, it took me years to undo that. Years. I think there's still days today where I have to remind myself of who God says I am because of this person 20 years ago who treated me this way. Friends, you are statements can really hurt people. And, uh, and here's what I also learned through that is hurting people do what? Hurt other people. So you get into this vicious cycle where you get hurt. And the next thing I know, I was calling other people names. And I was insulting other people. And I was treating other people in ways they didn't deserve to be treated. And I can think of some some examples in my life that really makes me feel bad for what I said and for what I did. Um, but it was because I was hurting. It comes out sideways, guys, and when we're hurt, we hurt other people. But Jesus is going to go on to say, therefore, if you were offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Now, he's talking about you have offended somebody. He's saying you need to leave your gift there in front of the altar. He's saying first go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. I mean, do you hear what he's saying? This needs to be a, being peacemakers, as he told us in the Beatitudes, this needs to be a priority in our life. He's like, don't hesitate. Like, before you come to church, if there's somebody you need to make peace with, he's like, you need to make peace. He goes on to say, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and he's saying, you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. What Jesus is saying here is, guys, it's just wise to make peace with people. It doesn't mean it's necessarily going to come to court or something like that, being thrown into jail. But you don't want to be a person who's constantly having to look over your shoulder because you've offended and hurt so many people. It's just wise. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a more, it's going to bring you peace as you become a peacemaker, trying to amend those relationships. And maybe you're responsible for being broken in your life. You know, I've hurt people over the years. Um, 
In fact, I, I just saw somebody recently, uh, it, was a, it, it wasn't a church service, but there was something going on right here at Edinburgh, and I saw this person across the room, and this person and I were, had a falling out, just say that, and um, I'm sitting there, I see this person, I, I know they're across the room, and I hear God telling me, you need to go make peace with that person. Uh, and so I was like, okay. <laughs> God, if that person's out in the lobby, you know, when this service that we were part of is over, I, I will go up to this person and, and try to extend that olive branch and, and make peace. And so the service came and went, and I found myself going, okay, God, new deal. I'm going to wait 10 minutes to see if this is really a sign from you that I should go make peace with this person. If that person is still in the lobby after 10 minutes, I will go and extend that olive branch and try to make peace with this person. So I waited 10 minutes and I went out in the lobby and guess what? They were still there. I said, God, new deal. I got to use the bathroom. I'm going to go use the bathroom, and if I come out and they're still there, I will go up and I will talk to that person. So I went to the bathroom, and when I came out, after rearranging some furniture out in the lobby and making sure things were straightened out a little bit, I sheepishly walked over to this person and started up the conversation. And we ended up making peace. In fact, next month I'm doing lunch with this person. And here's what was so, I guess, interesting to me about the whole thing is after the conversation, I, I felt this weight lifted off of my shoulders that I didn't expect. And the conversation went so much better than I thought it was, was going to go. Isn't that what the devil tries to do, though? It tries to tell us the conversation is going to go terrible and... Conversation went so much better. And, and I was just surprised how, how I went home just feeling lighter because I had made peace with this person that I'd been odds with um, for, for a while. But it started with a step, right? I had to take a step towards this person. I did, I, I confess, I, I tried to get out of it. I didn't want to do it. But eventually I had to take that step towards that person. And I just wonder, is there anyone in your life you need to take a step towards? Someone you've hurt, uh, someone you've offended. And may maybe, maybe it's just an email. Maybe it is trying to set up a time to do coffee or lunch. Maybe it's a phone call. And then maybe sometimes that person is going to say, no, I don't want to meet with you. I've had that happen too. Or I said, can we just get together and can we just talk? I don't want to talk to you. I've, I've had that happen as well. But I will tell you, most of the time, by far most of the time, the conversation goes so much better than I think it will go. And I'm telling you, you might just be surprised if you were to take that step. Maybe that person doesn't bless you, but God will. Because he will see your heart. And he calls us to be peacemakers. You know, maybe some of us are sitting in here this morning and, and, and we're feeling bad. As I was working on this message this week, there were people coming to my mind. And I have days where I just, I'm like, I can't believe I treated that person this way. I can't believe I called that person. I can't believe I did that to so-and-so. And friends, I just want to remind us that God sees your heart. If you'll have a soft heart before God, if you'll say, God, I want to be a peacemaker, I got good news for you. God will forgive you and take that judgment off of your life. In 1 John 1, 9, we read this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Any of us need to receive that this morning? I do. In fact, in just a moment, we're going to get to see some people being baptized. And isn't baptism just a beautiful picture of this, guys? It's just a beautiful picture because why? We're going to see people going under the water, and then they come out of that water. And what does that represent? It represents their sin, all of their unrighteousness being washed 
away. <laughs> now, some of these people we're going to have to hold under a little longer than others, right? <laughs> Just to make sure it takes. No, that's not how it works. What God's waiting to see is waiting to see our heart. Are we going to be peacemakers? He's waiting to see repentance. Are we going to surrender to his? Are we going to align our heart with his heart? If we're willing to do that, God's willing to extend forgiveness to you and me. And maybe some of us have been hurt in here. And you've had somebody hurt you and call you names. And I just want to give you a new name. I want to remind you what God says is true for you. God says you are loved. And what's amazing about that is we are the ones that offended him by our sin and rebelling from how he calls us to live. And yet he extends to us the olive branch, even though we're the ones who committed the offense, he extends to us the olive branch by sending Jesus to die on the cross and take our sins so that we can be forgiven and set free. And what some of you need to hear today is you are loved. Paul says this, he says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. My hope for you today is that you will walk out of here and know one thing. If you received this Christ, if you have received his forgiveness, you are loved. You are a child of the Most High God and exist in a family relationship with this God. That's who you are. So can we receive that this morning? Can we remind ourselves of that this week? <laughs> when past hurts and insults creep up into your mind, can you remind yourself, I am a child of the Most High God, and I am loved. I am forgiven. I am washed just like these baptisms are about to tell us. Friends, that's who you are, so walk in it. Will you join me in prayer? God, it can be such a hard thing to walk in, <laughs> knowing who we are and who you tell us. Who you tell us we really are. And, and my prayer this morning is that we will just be able to open up our hearts and, and receive it, not fight it, but receive it. That we will believe it in our heart of hearts. And we will know we are loved by you, that you know everything about us. You know all of our faults. You know all the mistakes that we have made. You know all of the mistakes we will make. That doesn't change the fact that we are your child. And God, maybe there's some of us here today that need to step into that and need to receive that forgiveness, maybe for the first time. Maybe we've hurt people. Maybe we've made a mess around us. I pray it would start with you this morning where we would just come to you and just say, God, because of what Christ has done for me, forgive me and wash me of my sin. Help me to align my heart with your heart. I surrender my will to your will. I want to be more like Jesus. And if there's strength that's needed to maybe make amends with somebody, God, right now we ask for the strength to do that so that we can live in peace and be peacemakers more and more here on earth. And now we want to lift up to those, those who are about to be baptized to you, God, and I just pray that you're going to use this as a means of grace in their life and uh, that they will see how you are working in them and through them, even through this act of saying, I am a follower of Jesus and I have surrendered my life to this Jesus. And I want the world to know. And so because of that, God, we're going to pray a special blessing on them as a church as they, as they do this. 
So we give you all the glory for how you're working and transforming lives and relationships here at Edinburgh Church. We're going to pray all this in your name, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen.